If you have a Bible, please do keep it open at the passage that was read to us from Romans 12. And last week we began a new series on this really important foundational passage to help us understand who we are in Christ Jesus and how we are to live in the time and context that we find ourselves. Let's pray and then we'll tuck in. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son. We thank you for sending your Spirit. And we pray we would receive more of your Spirit so we would become more like your Son and know more of your Father's love. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, recently I uh, read or reread Richard Wurmbrand's classic book, Tortured for Christ. And it's an account of his imprisonment for 14 years in uh, an atheist, communist Romanian jail. And he tells of a, an event, of an encounter with a chap called Piotr, who was a Russian soldier who came to faith shortly after World War II. And uh, this chap embraced Christ and wanted to be baptized. And as is the way in the Baptist context, you have a chosen verse that you then hold for your life, your life verse. And Piotr chose an unusual verse from Luke 24 and uh, from the story of Jesus meeting the two on the road to Emmaus. And it was the verse that says, when they came to their house, Jesus made us to go on. But the two insisted on Jesus staying. And Vern Brown says, that's a really unusual verse to have for your sort of baptism and life text. Why have you chosen that? And Piotr replied, the communists enter by violence into our hearts and minds. They force us to listen to them morning, noon, and night. Jesus doesn't kick down the door, and he doesn't impose his will, and he welcomes us to be welcomed in. He invites us to welcome him in and teach us his ways. Now, all cultures have worldviews. Those are lenses through which we view life and through which we do life. And some of these worldviews are imposed on us by others. But others, they sort of creep up on us incrementally. And we're sort of like a frog in the boiling water. It starts off cold, but it's being turned up. The heat's turned up. And before we know it, we are set at the temperature of the boiling water and dead. Almost all worldviews find themselves in conflict with the Christian worldview. And Christians, therefore, wherever they are, however they are, find themselves often at odds, in tension, in some sort of a conflict with the prevailing worldview of the culture and context that they find themselves in. And so we find ourselves feeling at times like strangers in the world which we inhabit. Paul here has been talking about worldviews. I encourage you to uh, listen to Stephen's message on this, Romans 12, 1 to 3, from last week. Um, Paul says in verse 1, do not be conformed to this world. Don't be squeezed into the mold of this world. Do not follow the agenda and the framework of this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the renewing takes place in our mind. And it's often in our mind where we rub up against this contrary worldview that we find ourselves, as it were, competing with. And Paul is writing to Christians in Rome. And some will have been formerly Orthodox Jewish followers of Yahweh. Others will have been pagan Romans formerly. Some will have been converted slaves who've come from far off countries who had their own previous idols and gods and worldviews. But all now are following Jesus. 
and they will be finding that there are points of real tension between the worldview, the lens through which they view and do life, or have done, and the world in which they now find themselves. And Paul is encouraging the church to think again, to rethink, to remodel, reformat our thinking in light of Christ, who he is and what he's done. And we need a Jesus rethink. And we can have been following Jesus for many years, but find that our thinking is still formatted by the world and the culture that we've been nurtured in rather than the milieu of Jesus. So in verse 3, Paul says, do not think. He says, you ought to think, and you're not to think. And here in particular, Paul wants us to think carefully about the question of identity and how we are to see ourselves and how we are to see others. And the lens through which we see ourselves and see others is the lens of Christ. It's his view. It's his perspective. It's not what society per se says. We've got to look through God's eyes. And many today are confused in our culture. A bit like Alice in Wonderland. They've fallen down a rabbit hole. Alice says this, it'll be no use their putting their heads down and saying, come up again, dear. I shall only look up and say, who am I then? Tell me that first. And then if I like being that person, I'll come up. But if not, I'll stay down here until I'm somebody else. I think very prophetic of where we find ourselves now, 100 years after it was written. But as Christians, we see ourselves and we see others through the eyes of Christ, through that worldview. And the spiritual writer, lovely Catholic writer, Henri Nguyen, says, spiritual identity means we are not what we do or what people say about us, not what our culture, Amelia, says about us. We are not what we have. We are the beloved daughters of God. How God sees us is key to how we live. Now let me just make three short points from this text. First, how did Paul view himself? How does Paul see himself? Well, verse 3 says, By the grace given to me, I say to you. By the grace given to me, I say to you. The leadership management guru Simon Sinek says, you must know your why. You must know your why. He's talking about businesses. You've got to know what you're about, why, you're, why you exist and what it is you're offering. And Paul knew his who, and he knew his what, and he knew his why. And it was all predicated on a when, of when he met Jesus and everything was changed. And Paul knew himself from God's perspective. Lots of different people in lots of different contexts had views of who Paul was, but he knew himself preeminently from what God had done and what God said and what God had gifted him. Paul never forgot and never recovered from the encounter with Jesus on that Damascus road. And there he received a a whole paradigm shift in his worldview. He saw the shining light. He was knocked off his horse. He had some sense knocked into him. And ever thereafter, what determined his self-understanding and the trajectory of his life was that encounter with Jesus and what Jesus did in his life. What mattered was not his education per se, his past track record, his race, his profession, his personality profile, but what Jesus had done for him. And the amazing thing was that Jesus turned a terrorist into an evangelist. The extraordinary thing, that Damascus Road encounter. And then he says, by the grace given to me. And grace becomes the all-determining word in the Apostle Paul's life, because grace was the preeminent experience. At the end of his life, grace literally means free gift. 
that he was the one who was the recipient of the goodness of God. At the end of his life, he wrote in 1 Timothy 1, even though I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, I was shown mercy, and the grace of our Lord Jesus was poured out on me lavishly along with faith and love in Christ Jesus. I was shown mercy, regardless of what I once was, a persecutor, blasphemer, a violent man, seeking to kill Christians and oppose Christ. I was shown mercy and grace was poured out on me lavishly. I love the word lavish. When I think of lavish, I think of food. Uh, I just think, you know, my wife, she, she cares about my diabetes and my heart disease, and she's always kind of nitpicking at food. God bless her, she does it because she loves me. But I go for lavish. I don't want some sort of minimalist approach to food. She actually tried to book a restaurant the other day. It was our wedding anniversary last week. I said, I don't want to go there. She said, why not? I thought, little portions. I'm not going to go But lavish. And that's how Paul understood himself. That God is lavish with his grace. And Paul had experienced it. And whether he was being beaten by Jewish mobs or arrested and imprisoned by Roman authorities or sharing the gospel at a riverbank or in someone's home or in a synagogue or before kings and emperors. Grace is what he led with. Grace was preeminent. That's the worldview through which he sees everything. God's grace. That's his ground zero, is grace. And then he says, by the grace of God given to me, I say to you. Paul was graced to grace others. Paul was given a gift that we was to give away. Emily on our team was, had a word recently when we were, uh, uh, the leadership went away for 24 hours to pray and prepare and uh, she had this prophetic word. She says, I feel God has blessed us to bless others. I mean, simple but so profound. Some of you who are Oxford know that you have a grace at formal dinner and you say, Benedictus Benedicat, let the blessed one bless. And that can be read two ways in the Latin. Let the blessed one bless the food. But equally legitimate in Latin, it can mean let the one who's been blessed with this bless the one who's given to us. Deliberate ambiguity there. In the t- but we've been blessed to bless. We've been blessed to bless. That's our worldview. That's our way of it. And Paul says, I've been graced to grace you. And I'm going to grace you with the word. By the grace given to me, I say to you. The gift he had was to bring God's word to them. And there's a responsibility to steward the gift that God has given us. To share the gift that God has given us. And for us to embrace the gift that God has given to others. We're going to talk more about that next week. But Paul's teeing it up here in the passage by talking about his own gifting. And by God's grace, I say to you. His gift is to communicate the word of God. And to frame and input and instruct and direct and bless their lives. And God in his goodness and providence has kept, as it were, treasured, enabled the church to keep and treasure and protect and collate and pass on, despite persecution, those grace words of Paul. And that's why two millennia later, literally, we're reading him. And through what he said back then, back there, God right here, right now, is still speaking to us. We need to think correctly. We need to have a renewed mind. And how does that happen? We need not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of our mind. Where? In the worldview that God offers us in Scripture. And so the the first challenge for us this morning, when I got a couple, but here's one, is what word are you listening to? What word, what worldview is formatting your mind and directing your life? What are the authority figures 
and voices that are shaping and influencing and molding the person you are and how you look at life and do life and think about yourself and how you spend your money and your time and, and so on. What's occupying your headspace? Because Paul, talking about worldview and being transformed, then says, by the grace of God given to me, I say to you. And we need to listen to what he's got to say. We need to listen to what God's got to say. We need to read it and heed it. And it's in this amazing book. According to a 2022 survey on social media, 4.7 billion people use it. Amazing. I'm not one of them. That may be a problem, or maybe I need to be. But apparently the average time spent daily using social media is two hours and 29 minutes. I don't know how they get that number, but what that suggests to me is that some people do it for a few minutes and some people do it for five or six hours a day on social media, trying to find out who they are by listening to people they've never met tell them, directing their lives. And psychologists are very clear, there's a lot of mounting evidence on this, that it's just bad for our mental health. And there's a worrying cause of disassociation as a result of time spent on social media. And what is disassociation? It means that we lose touch with our identity and our reality. And, it, and we need to find that in God's word, that word, that worldview, where we're formatted. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Secondly, that's how Paul thought of himself. Second, how should we think of ourselves? In verse three, it goes on to say, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment. Now, Paul's writing to the Romans. That's why it's called the Romans, this letter. And... Uh, you know, Rome was the center of the universe, really. By then, Rome's the eternal city. And this is in its golden age. It re reached its peak in about 117 under Trajan. But it was on its way up. It, this was the great power player in the world. Greatest empire the world ever seen. And by then, what was known as the Pax Romana had been established, the peace of Rome. They had imposed their rule and will. They conquered everything. Now, if you were Roman or in Rome, you swaggered. I mean, the buildings made you swagger. You were somebody. Even if you were just the lowest of the low and you were a slave in Rome, at least you were a slave in Rome. A Roman slave. There were 15 Roman virtues, the Via Romana, the Roman way, and humility was not one of them. <laughs> How are we to think of ourselves? Paul says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment. And he challenges the church. Don't inculcate the culture. Don't be tarnished by it. He uses the phrase hupophroneo, literally meaning to throw beyond, to go beyond a kind of higher, and phroneo, mind, higher mind. Don't think of yourselves more highly. Don't think too much of yourself, but think of yourself with sober judgment. Take a good look at yourself, warts and all. Don't, try, don't base your opinion on what your dog thinks of you. Your dog's biased because you feed it. <laughs> Thanks very much. And, uh, <laughs> but we need, we need honesty about ourselves. Take a good look at yourself, but don't look too often. One of the main problems in our culture is pride. But I think not so much a swaggering self-promotion, although I was, once, I was once on the, went with my wife to Cambridge for a couple of days, and they said, where have you come from? I said, oh, we come from Oxford. And they said, oh, you can always tell an Oxford student in Cambridge. I said, how? They said, the head and their nose is in the air. <laughs> I'm sure we say the same about them, but anyway. Not swaggering self-promotion. I don't think that's the main problem most of the time. 
especially here in Oxford with our students. I think the main problem is the flip side of that, pride and arrogance, which is insecurity and a sense of inferiority and a comparison with others and are always coming out worse off. That's what I think is a controlling narrative in our world. And I think often the social media makes it worse because we're looking at airbrushed Instagram images and we're thinking, I don't look like that. I haven't got what they've got. I'm not as smart as them. I haven't got as many followers. I'm not as connected to them. And we feel less about ourselves. And how pathetic is that? And yet it's true. It's what we do. We compare ourselves to others. Some in order to puff themselves up. But many of us, I think it is the curse of our age, suffering from insecurity, but it's still a form of pride. Here's the reality. Humble people are not insecure. Humble people aren't insecure. And the closer we come to Jesus, the more humble we are, but not the more insecure we become. Even as we were worshipping, and worship is where we find ourselves. And wasn't that worship amazing earlier? But even as we worship, we, we know ourselves. We are, we're not worshipping ourselves. We're not worshipping the band. We're worshipping the Lord and creator of the universe. And we are puny and infinitesimally small compared to him. He's the one with all the glory. And yet, even as we worship him, we're not insecure. We grow. If we don't worship, we shrink, but if we worship, we grow, we become ourselves. And in his presence, fullness of joy. The worshiper turns from self, and I believe worship is the antidote to insecurity and pride. Last week I was teaching in Ireland, and uh, a chap met me at the airport, and uh, you know, can I take your bags? I said, no, you're all right. And, we got to his car, and he was just a very nice, gentle, meek, quiet kind of guy. And I was the visiting speaker all week. And I got in his car, and we drove off. And it was a long drive, an hour and a quarter or so. And uh, I just started asking, you know, so tell me about yourself. Have you got family? No. He was in his 60s. And, uh, and little by little, he just let a few things out. I thought, oh, well, I'll pull a bit more from you on that. Anyway, it turns out that this guy was the head surgeon for Ireland. And he had an international um, uh, role. He was the head, a national role, a governmental role. <laughs> that he had trained all over the world. That he was the senior surgeon for Ireland. I mean, I didn't understand that exactly how it was. But I realized this man's like a player. He's a serious heavy hitter. I mean, he was thin, so he wasn't very heavy, but he was a hitter. <laughs> it was amazing. I said, so what are you doing? What, what's, why are you picking me up in the car? What's all this about then? And he just retired. And he said he'd offered himself to the bishop, and he's now just driving people f from the airport. You know, I rarely meet someone that special, that important. At, lunch, at dinner that night, uh, I was sat with the secretary of the bishop. I said, you know, this chap, let's call him Bob, this chap, Professor Bob, I said, what a, what a dear man he is. And the secretary just said one word, humble. So she said, humble. I thought, yeah, humble. Godly. Close to Christ. He knew himself. He didn't make much of himself. Yet because he lived in the shadow of the Lord, the Lord had made much of him. It was a beautiful thing. Culture is not to define us. Jesus does. And Jesus at the cross, we learn that we are really sorry. We're really sad. We're sinful. We deserve death and punishment for the wrong that we've done. And yet, top trumps. God's love triumphs over it. And we are overwhelmingly loved. So we've got to see ourselves as Jesus sees us. Sinful but loved to the end. And then lastly, in just a couple of minutes, I've pinched time somewhere. How should we think about other people? Paul says, verse 4, as one body we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. 
So we, though many, are one body in Christ, individually members of one another. How are we to view the other? We're to see them as connected to me, as part of my life, of how I do life. Karl Barth, who I did my research on, he was a a brilliant theologian, but not always right. And um, sometimes he could get a bit rarefied and a bit abstract. And one of his sort of um, young pupils, if you like, uh, someone who was inspired by him was the remarkable man, later the martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And um, Bonhoeffer was wrestling with Barth's theology. And there's a letter that Bonhoeffer wrote to Barth, and it just says something like this, Have you ever met a person? (laughs) Have you ever met a person? I mean, your theology is just like, you know. And Bonhoeffer's doctorate was called Life Together. Oh, that came out of it later. But Life Together. Communion of the saints, the holy communion. And that's the reality. Christianity is not solitaire. And it's not a spiritual solo ascent. It's a team sport, as our rector often says to us. It's a team sport. We're in it together. Come on. The primary pronouns of the Christian life are not me, my, I, but we and you and ours and us. It's life together. We're going to think more about this next week, so I'm going to move fast here. And Paul employs one of his favorite metaphors for the church, that of a body. Unity, unity and diversity and beauty, but diversity. A body that was all eyes or all hands would be a monster or a cartoon, but it wouldn't be a body. There is distinction and difference yet held together, and altogether it makes it beautiful. A church where everything's the same or everyone's the same or they all look the same or the primary gifting is the same, is ugly. It's an aberration. We're a body. We're a symphony. All the instruments playing together. A mate of mine is the head or principal percussionist for a very famous symphony orchestra. And he told me that in one piece he'd been playing that in Austria or somewhere. He just did, he, he's, he's playing the cymbals, a two hour long symphony, and he hit them once. <laughs> he said, but boy, when he hit them, it was a real moment, you know. Ba-da! And there are parts of the body that are up front and at the back, and more prominent and less so. But we all need each other. What we don't want is, a, is everyone to be a preacher or a Bible teacher. Please, no. You know, we've got a few of them. But we need people who can serve and people who can pray and people who can be creative and people who are evangelists and people who are mentors and people who can lead. We need one another. We're going to think about this next week. And we need to call out and identify and respect and receive the gifts of others. How are we to view the other? We view them from the point of view that we need them, we love them, we honor them, and we receive what they've got. Let me finish. 34 years ago, I married my amazing missus. And uh, as I got into the car to drive away on the honeymoon, my dear old dad says, remember you're a Ponsonby. And I have no idea what he meant. (laughs) I mean, for years I've thought about it. I can't bring myself to ask him. I I said, what is that? Anyway, this summer, my boy... My oldest boy got married to dear Verity, and just as he got into the taxi, I just felt we've got a family tradition now. (laughs) I said, remember you're a Ponsonby. And he sort of got in the car. (laughs) Verity's grandmother was stood beside me. She sort of looked at me with this strange look. I said, We've got some wonderful DNA that's just married into our family. And she seemed to be impressed by that comment. Listen, I, I have no idea what my dad meant. Remember, you're a Ponson, you know. And I'm not going to guess, but we've got to remember who we are. That's what Paul is saying. Remember who you are. Rem- and when you know who you are, live who you are, despite what culture and context will tell you. Let Christ's grace in your life come. 
be the commentary uh, on you and then inspire your activity. Amen.